we're moving on to a new topic. Um, so up until now, we have been talking about signals, one-dimensional images, if you will. Uh, images, still images, um, both grayscale and color. We did things like edges and the hog descriptor. And now we're going to add the next logical dimension, which is time, of course. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about motion estimation, arguably one of the most important things in any temporal sequence is how are things moving? So think, self-driving car, what do I want to know about? Is there a pedestrian in front of me? Motion. Is there a car coming up next to me? Motion. Uh, think a security camera. Is there somebody on my premises? Motion. And so motion has a long um, history in the computer vision community of how do you estimate motion and then, of course, eventually quantify that motion. Is it a pedestrian? Is it an animal? Is it a leaf? Is it another car? Is it something I need to avoid? Is it something I don't need to avoid? That's a classification problem, but underlying that is the first and foremost problem of how do we estimate motion. So let's think about this little sequence right here. Um, from uh, beginning to end, you can see it's a, a four frame sequence, very short. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that the car is moving. So here, the white car in the middle of the intersection is turning the corner. And you may not immediately see it, but there's also a car entering from either end of the street, and there's a little motion elsewhere. And our job, our task here, to, is to determine at every pixel how much motion is there and what direction is that motion. So, it actually, that sounds a lot like a gradient. In fact, it sounds a lot like the gradient in the orientation. How much is things moving? Gradient. And in which direction is it moving? Orientation. Except now we're in the temporal domain instead of purely the spatial domain. And that's not an accident, by the way, because we're going to talk about uh, motion in two different ways, one of which will sound a lot like computing edges. So how do we do this? Well, the simplest way to think about this is, so what does it mean for something to be moving? It's like I identify a point on an object, say in frame one, and I just want to track it to frame two, to frame three, and to frame four. And visually, you and I can do this trivially. Once I put a little red dot onto the front of that car, I can ask you in the next frame, please show me where that dot is, that point is, where is that point, where is that point? And you can see then that from frame one to frame two, I now know direction of motion and how much it moved. Just draw that little vector that I'm showing you here. And that's relatively easy for us to do that visually, but of course we want to do that computationally. So one way to do uh, motion estimation is the so-called feature tracking. We'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit. Another way to do this is to think about this in terms of differential operators. What am I asking for is what is the rate of change now in intensity, not in space, x and y, but in time? So for example, here what I'm showing you is the difference between neighboring frames. And what do you notice? is that where there was motion, there is a bright spot. And where there's not motion, it's exactly the same. Why, why is that? So think about two frames. I'm going to stand really still right now. And imagine looking at two frames of this video and differencing them. They would be black. Nothing changed. And now imagine I do this between frame one and frame two, and you take a difference. Well, all this stuff in the slide that you see would have stayed the same, but there'd be this big white spot where I moved. And so when we ask about the rate of change in time, we get a sense of motion. Because when I go from white to dark, there is a change as a, as a function of time. And that's so-called differential motion as opposed to here's a point, find it again, find it again, find it again. We're going to start with differential motion and we'll eventually get back to feature tracking and then we'll talk about the relative pros and cons of each of the techniques. Now, we've already got some intuition as to how we're going to compute uh, a differential motion, because we've already talked about derivatives in the context of spatial derivatives. We're just going to add a time dimension. And the way we're going to derive this is we're going to start by making some assumptions. We're going to assume the so-called brightness constancy assumption. And what the brightness constancy assumption says, that motion in the scene is the result of, of motion and not changes in the apparent intensity. So here are two explanations for the following two frames. So I'm at frame one right here, and I'm here at frame two. One explanation is I moved. Here's another explanation. 
instantane at, at, at time one, I'm standing here, and at time two, I literally shape shifted to be completely black, and then these pixels over here shape shifted to be to reconstruct me. So that is every pixel changed intensity, but there was no motion. And we can't tell the difference between that, except one of them seems exceedingly unlikely and the other one seems likely. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to assume that as I move through the world, I do not change in intensity. Now that's actually not quite true. So here, for example, I've got a big light next to me. I'm gonna get close to it so you can see how bright I am here. And as I move further back, for example, over here, you can see I've gotten a little darker. So the brightness constancy assumption doesn't actually hold over long periods of time necessarily because I move in and out relative to the illuminations that are around me. But from frame one to frame two, there's very little uh, motion. And since we're gonna be doing this differentially over small time frames, that's a pretty reasonable assumption for most surfaces. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write my now space time volume. I've got an image, x of t, y of t, and I've added the t there because the x and y locations depend on time, of course. And I've added another dimension, which is the time dimension, which is going to tell me um, the frame one, frame two, frame three. And by my assumption, I'm going to assume that the derivative of the space time volume as a function of time is zero, right? So that just simply means that I'm not changing intensity as I move from here to here. And so any changes in intensity must be due to motion. All right, so let's see how we go from this initial assumption to a mechanism for estimating motion from a series of frames. All right, so go back to multi-dimensional, uh, multi-parameter uh, multi, uh, uh, differentiation, calculus rather, and let's apply the chain rule. Why the chain rule? I'm differentiating f with respect to t, but x and y also depend on t. So the chain rule says that the full derivative of this with respect to t is df dx dx dt plus df dy dy dt plus df dt, um, which is the derivative of this thing with respect, the partial derivative with respect to time. So let's see what, and by the way, this of course is still equal to zero. That's my brightness constancy assumption. So I've just applied the chain rule here to get the derivatives. What is df dx? df dx is the derivative of the intensity in the x direction. We know how to do that. We've already done that. What is df dy? It's the rate of change in the y direction. Now I've got time here. So which frame do I use? Do I use the first frame or the second frame? We'll get back to that in a little, in a little bit. What is dx dt and dy dt? It's the change in the x position is a function of time. Well, that's the motion. That's exactly what I want to estimate. Beautiful. Okay, so let's rewrite these to get rid of this uh, clumsy notation. df dx is f of x. dx dt is the rate of change in spatial position is a function of time. That's my velocity in the x direction. And then of course I have df dy, I've got vy, the rate of change, the, the velocity in the y direction, and then I've got my temporal derivative, how much am I changing as a function of time? And of course that is equal to zero because of the brightness constancy assumption up top. Now let me rewrite this in a linear algebraic form because then we'll see clearly where we are. So I've got my unknown vx, vy, that's what I want. And I've got things that I can measure. I know how to compute fx, fy. I've already seen that. I haven't shown you how to compute ft, but well, actually I sort of did. And when I take the difference of two images, that's a crude approximation to a derivative. So I can measure fx, ft. I can measure F, fx, fy rather. I can measure ft and I wanna know vx, vy, the velocity, the motion, what direction am I moving in and by how much. Now, where am I here? So the good news is I've got a linear equation. We love linear equations, they're easy to solve. The bad news is I have two unknowns and only one constraint. So I have an under constrained system of linear equations. So I'm sort of dead in the water. But this is, I specified this for a single pixel in the image. Yeah, this is for a single point at uh, x, y, and a single velocity at that, that, that pixel, vx, vy. And so, if I assume in a small neighborhood, let's say a little three by three pixel neighborhood, that all the motion is going to be the same, well then I should take, be able to take advantage of that. And is that a reasonable assumption? Well, sure, if you look at a small region on my head right here, as I move, that moves in the same direction. 
Now, if you're unlucky and you're looking right at the boundary and you take some from the background and some from the foreground, you're going to get a little bit of slop there. But let's just go ahead and assume that we can look at a small patch in the image, and we're going to assume that the velocity is the same at each of those. And how does that help me? Well, I now have this equation written out for nine different regions in the image uh, in a little three by three block, all of which I'm assuming have the same velocity. So let's go back up to here. I've got fx, fy at position x1, uh, y1 times vx, vy uh, plus the temporal derivative at that point is equal to zero. Notice, by the way, I've got a vector here because I'm now going to have a number of different uh, constraints here. Now, go to the next pixel in that little three by three blocks. It has its own spatial derivative. I've moved over one pixel, but the velocity per my assumption is the same, and I compute the temporal derivative at that pixel, and I keep repeating that for all nine pixels in a little three by three patch. So now what do I have? I have nine constraints and two unknowns. Ah, I have have an over-constrained system of linear equations, and now I know what to do. I know how to solve over-constrained uh, systems of linear equations. And so the beautiful thing here is making this two relatively simple assumptions, brightness constancy, the change in appearance of something. Uh, a, a, a patch does not change in appearance over a relatively small moment in time, and the velocity in a small patch is constant, which allowed me to go from one constraint to multiple constraints. And so now the system I have is I have some matrix A with a bunch of spatial derivatives, which I know how to calculate. I have an unknown vector V. Those are my two components of motion that I'm trying to estimate, that little vector, uh, plus a vector T of temporal derivatives, which I know and I will show you in a minute how to calculate, is equal to zero. And now I want to solve. And this is a relatively easy system of linear equations to solve. So let me bring it back over to here. Here's my system of linear equations. I've got my spatial derivatives. I have my unknown vx, vy. I have my temporal derivatives equal to zero. A, V plus T equals zero. Now, if A was a square matrix, well, I would be done. I would just invert the matrix and I'm home. So that would be a fully constrained system of linear equations. Here I have an over-constrained system of linear equations, so I have to do a pseudo-inverse. I'm going to go ahead and just derive that for you. If you've not seen pseudo-inverse, if you have not seen least squares, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly here, and then we're going to do it a little bit later in the semester again in, in, in much slower and more in detail. So if you don't get some of the steps here, don't worry. We're going to review all of this material uh, in a few weeks downstream. So what I'm going to do is take this linear system of equations and I'm going to write a quadratic error function that says I want to find the v, the unknown motion, that minimizes the sum of the squares of the, uh, of the sorry, this um, the av plus t, because I want that to be equal to zero. This is a quadratic error function because of the square term right here. So those two double bars there correspond to vector norm. av plus t is equal to a vector. And I want to drive, I want to find the V that drives that to zero. And because it's quadratic, I can solve that in closed form. And the way I'm going to solve it is I'm going to take that quadratic error function, I'm going to differentiate it with respect to V, which is 2 A transpose times AV plus T. And then I'm going to set that equal to zero, and I'm going to solve, and I get my classic least square solution, which is minus A transpose A inverse, that's now a square matrix, times A transpose times t. And again, if this is a little unclear, if you haven't seen it before, don't worry. You're not going to have to know how to derive this in order to do motion estimation. We're going to look at the code later on. But we will eventually go through all of this in a little bit more detail to make sure you understand it. And so I now have a solution for my velocity. I build that matrix A, and I build that vector t with a bunch of space time derivatives. Again, I'll show you the code in a little bit how I compute that. And then all I have to do is invert that little matrix and do a little bit of matrix algebra, and I'm home. It's worth looking at what's inside of these things um, for a couple of reasons. One is, any time you go to invert a matrix, you had better ask yourself, is this matrix going to be invertible? It's not guaranteed to be, be, inver it's not guaranteed to be invertible. It could be rank deficient, could be zero rank, could be one rank. Um, so let's go ahead and look at what's going to happen here. So what is A? A is just the spatial derivatives for each of those nine pixels in the three by three block where I assume the motion is constant, packed into a nine by two uh, matrix. A transpose, of course, is just that transposed. And so I'm going to take the product of those two, and of course, 
this matrix is uh, two by nine, this matrix is nine by two, and so the product of those is two by two. So now I have a little square matrix that is just this. In the first position, I have omega here is just my little nine by nine patch, so I've written that as omega. It could have been four by four, it could have been five by five, six by six, I just chose a three by three just for notational simplicity. So in this component, I have the sum of the squares of the x derivatives. In the, the other diagonal, I have the sum of the squares of the y derivative. And then in the off diagonal, I have the sum of the product in the x's and the y. So a little two by two matrix, which is just different linear combinations of all the derivatives in that little three by three patch. Now, this little guy here is the A matrix times the T matrix. So the A matrix, again, is the spatial derivatives packed in in a, in a nine by two matrix. And this, of course, is are the temporal derivatives packed in. Now, this, of course, should be transposed. So this should be two by nine, and this is nine by two. And then when I take that product, what do I have? Again, omega is that little patch I'm integrating over, three by three. And now I have the sum of the x times the t derivatives at each pixel location, and then the sum of the y derivatives and the t derivatives. Okay, so why did I do all of this? I did it in part because it actually gives us a construction on how to compute the derivatives. I build this, I compute the derivatives, space-time derivatives, I, I compute this little two by two matrix, I compute this little two by one vector, and then I invert the matrix and multiply by this, done. So um, that was a lot of derivation for a very simple idea. So let's just go back and make sure we understand. We're trying to estimate motion from a time series. If it makes it simple, let's just assume we have two frames, frame one, frame two. And what we did is we made two simplifying assumptions. We assumed brightness constancy, that a patch on something moving is not going to change intensity when it moves from left to right or bottom to up. We also assumed a sort of smoothness assumption, essentially, that whatever the motion is at this pixel, the motion around it is going to be the same. And that's a pretty safe assumption for things like rigid body motions where things are sort of moving um, relatively smoothly. And what we did is we started with that brightness constancy assumption and we worked out the derivative and it turned out that we could estimate motion using a simple least squares estimation. Again, if you didn't get the details of that quadratic error function and the differentiation, don't worry about that right now. At the end of all of that derivation was build a little two by two matrix, invert it. Build a little two by one vector, con all consisting of space time derivatives, which we've seen most of, but we're gonna see a little bit more in a bit. And then do that over and over again for every pixel, invert that matrix, multiply it by the vector, and you will get two estimates, one for the velocity in x and one for the velocity in y. And so what we need to now do is we really need to instantiate this. I like deriving the math because I think it's incredibly important that you understand where these things come from. The easiest thing in the world for me to do is just give you an equation and don't tell you where it comes from. The derivations are important, but now we're going to go ahead and implement this to make sure we understand it. 